Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 33 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. We invite those of you who are listening on Minnesota Public Radio to visit us in person. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming forums can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker to a packed house here at Westminster Sanctuary. Even the choir loft is filled. And we're expecting great things from the choir later in the presentation. <laughs> Dr. Evan Alexander has been an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years on the medical staff at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, and the Harvard Medical School. A graduate of Duke University School of Medicine, he has authored or co-authored over 150 chapters and papers in peer-reviewed journals and made over 200 presentations at conferences and medical centers around the world. He's the author of the best-selling book, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey in the Afterlife, which recounts his near-death, out-of-body experience while in a coma from a form of E. coli meningitis. After decades as an academic and practicing neurosurgeon, he is now committed to pursuing the meaning of human consciousness and reconciling his spiritual experience with contemporary physics and cosmology. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Eben Alexander. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a, a real joy and privilege to be in this beautiful church and to be back in Minneapolis. I actually spent the summer of 1978 working at the U. Uh, in a neurophysiology lab, and I had a wonderful time that summer. Came to really love Minneapolis, uh, but of course I realize that those of you here 12 months out of the year see something a little different from what I saw in those three summer months. And I'm getting a glimpse of that today. Well, uh, what I'd like to do is really focus a bit on consciousness and the nature of consciousness and what my journey says about that and why it has tremendous implications for how we understand the nature of our very existence and of all reality. Um, I think to tell this story properly, I would like to see a show of hands. How many have not read the book Proof of Heaven? You won't be graded on this, I promise. Okay, good. Um, well, I really will not have time to recount that journey in detail because that's all available in the book. Uh, but I will hit on some of the high points of that journey and where they intersect with a deeper understanding of the nature of our existence. Now, important to understand uh, in my whole story is realizing who I was before. Uh, I was brought up in a scientific family. My father was a tremendous influence on my life. He was very religious. He had grown up in eastern Tennessee. He knew that when he operated on a patient and that patient did well, it was mainly God's work and not his own. I grew up in the 60s and 70s fully embracing science as the arbiter of truth. I'll tell you today, I'm more of a scientist than I've ever been. But I also realized that the science that I worshipped before my coma that happened five years ago, and I use that word intentionally, uh, because materialist science, it says it's all just the whirling of electrons, protons, quarks, neutrons, atoms, molecules, the cells of the brain, and all the rest of physical reality. That material science uh, is a faith-based religion that actually has very little to support it. Even the materialist scientists are in a headlong rush to tell you now that there's no material to the material world. It's vibrating strings of energy in higher dimensional space-time at best. Uh, I, I always love in this reference that beautiful quote from Sir James Jeans, spoken in the 1940s when he was wrestling with the deep mysteries of quantum mechanics. He said that the universe begins to look much more like a great thought than a great machine. And of course, uh, I'm sure he had some idea of who was doing the thinking. And that's what this is really all about, is coming to a deeper sense of that. Now, the me before coma, uh, as much as I wanted to believe in God and an afterlife and the power of prayer and all those things, in decades spent in neurosurgery, 
I found myself wondering, how does consciousness survive the death of the brain and body? And that, to me, was a big mystery that luckily uh, I gained some tremendous insight into five years ago right now, because it was five years ago uh, this week that I actually came out of a seven-day coma. Now, um, I think it's important to point out in terms of elucidating how little we actually know about consciousness, because I'd never really questioned it before, and some of my critics out there will say, well, Alexander's not even a neuroscientist, he's just a neurosurgeon. Okay. Well, in fact, they're, they're right. There's not much we have to know about consciousness in neurosurgery, and we certainly don't have to get deeply into the mechanism of consciousness, but that is what is called the hard problem of consciousness, and I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Uh, it's important to point out, though, that, for example, we use general anesthesia. We've been doing that for more than 150 years, and yet there is no one on Earth who can offer you the first sentence as to how general anesthesia seems to temporarily abate consciousness. I hope that gives you an idea how little we actually understand about the phenomenon of consciousness. Uh, important to point out here, a uh, realization that I came to after my coma, remember that all of experience, everything you've ever experienced uh, in your existence since before you were born, uh, is a model of a reality. It is a model based on the flickering of 10 billion neurons in your brain in a three pound gelatinous mass floating in a warm dark bath. This is all just signals coming in in time and space. We put it together and we say, you know, there's that reality out there. But that's why quantum mechanics presents us with such a deep and vexing mystery about the nature of that reality because quantum mechanics drove the founding fathers, very brilliant physicists, into mysticism because it demanded they come to a much deeper understanding of what consciousness and the, the mind and the observer truly is. And of course, that was something I never really questioned very much before my coma, but my coma experience showed me very clearly that I'd better get to some deeper answers about that. And in fact, I came to realize that everything I ever thought I could know about the nature of existence and reality had to be tossed out. I had to start over at square one to begin to get to this. Now, it turns out five years ago, that worldview of pure scientific materialism, thinking brain creates consciousness, the only way we can know anything is through our physical senses, uh, that's local consciousness, um, and thinking that it's all birth to death and nothing more. Those three erroneous thoughts were in my mind. My coma showed me very clearly how they are false and started leading me towards understanding a deeper truth. Now, what happened, is I woke up at 4.30 in the morning, November 10th, 2008, with severe back pain, and soon realized I had a very bad headache. Of course, anyone in medicine hearing of sudden onset, severe back pain, severe headache, would think meningitis. Well, the doctor was already out. I was gone. My brain was being overrun by an extremely rare, aggressive, primitive, and absolutely should have killed me bacterial meningitis. And in fact, it was soon thereafter that I slipped into coma with grand mal seizures and was then rushed off to the uh, emergency room where a very astute physician realized I might have meningitis, uh, did a lumbar puncture, and when the fluid surrounding brain and spinal cord came out of my back, it was thick white pus under pressure. And my, that doctor later told me that when she saw that, she knew I was dead. In fact, by going into a hospital with a diagnosis of gram-negative bacterial meningitis, going into coma within a few hours, I was already down below a 10% chance of survival. And that only got worse during the week. I was put on three very powerful antibiotics. In fact, by the end of the week, they had more than tripled the dose of one of those antibiotics, uh, maximum, triple beyond the maximum dose recommended, trying to turn this around. And I was down to a 2% chance of survival. And that's why the doctors at the very end of that week on a Sunday morning, day seven, uh, recommended that it was time to stop the antibiotics and just let nature take its course. And of course, it was soon thereafter that I started coming back to this world. Important to point out, my brain was so absolutely savaged by that uh, illness that when I came back, I had absolutely no memory whatsoever of my life before coma, no words or language, although words came back within hours. Uh, no memory of my childhood, although that came back with the help of my sisters, one of whom is sitting here in the audience, Phyllis. I'm very grateful to all of my family for being there and all that they did, that loving connection to bring me back. Um, and memories of that childhood came back with their 
help over the next few weeks. Memories of my knowing a brain-mind consciousness after 20 years experience in neurosurgery took up to eight weeks to return. And in fact, all I knew when I came back to this world was this brilliant, incredible, ultra-real spiritual journey I had been on deep in coma. Now, the me before uh, would have told you that with such an illness, uh, given that that kind of severe bacterial meningitis is a perfect model for human death. In fact, it's so perfect that almost nobody ever comes back to tell the tale. And that's why my story has garnered significant attention in the medical and scientific communities. Because, in fact, uh, using the, uh, the thinking of that uh, conventional neuroscience, given the destruction that was apparent to my doctors through neurologic exams and scans and lab values, I should have had no experience at all. Uh, at best, maybe that first phase that I describe in the book, uh, the earthworm's eye view. That's where the whole experience started. For me, it was a very primitive, coarse, ugly uh, existence, very unresponsive. And uh, luckily, it didn't last forever, even though it seemed to at the time. And I was rescued by a spinning white light, perfect, pure white light with fine white and gold filaments that open up like a rip in the fabric around me into a lovely gateway valley, a perfect, ultra-real valley, lush with life. And I was moving up through it because I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing with millions of other butterflies, lots of souls dancing below us, joy and mirth. And beside me on the butterfly wing, a beautiful girl. And of course, she later provided the key, as those who have read the book will realize, the key that helped me to understand the reality of the journey. But that was four months after I came out of the coma. Deep in the middle of coma, her message to me was most assuring. And just to recall it now just gives me shivers because of the beauty and the joy and the all-encompassing love that was part of it. And she never said a word, this beautiful girl on the butterfly wing with sparkling blue eyes and high cheekbones, high forehead, wide smile. But her thoughts came straight into my awareness. And these I share with all of you because they are important for all of us. This is the central message. You are deeply loved and cherished forever. There is nothing you can do wrong in that realm. In a strict sense, we have the choice of free will that God gives us through that intense love God has for each and every one of us personally. And that's why it's such a gift because God has to feel our pain even more than we do when we use that free will to forget our connection to the divine and to each other. And of course, there are a lot of other things we can do that involve learning lessons here, potentially pain and suffering to others, that we may have to learn residual lessons in a life review after we leave this world. But the, the message from her was very clear, unconditional love, infinite love of that creator. And in fact, in that beautiful realm, that was greatly amplified because the joy and mirth in all of these souls down below was fueled by these swooping orbs of pure golden spiritual beings up above, leaving sparkling trails and emitting these anthems, crescendo after crescendo of the most beautiful, to say the word heavenly, of course, uh, goes without saying, but uh, as I put it all in writing, weeks later, I said that those swooping orbs of light above were angelic choirs. And in fact, the beauty of that realm was only the beginning because those angelic choirs, just as that spinning melody, that white light that had ushered me from the earth where my view into that lovely gateway realm, music, sound, vibration. This is a huge part of the work that I do now in trying to take uh, the lessons from my journey and from cultures going back thousands of years about music and sound, and also the scientific aspects that I discussed towards the end of the book about using various audio uh, patterns to uh, synchronize the hemispheres and basically to duplicate the biggest mystery of my journey. That is, the me before coma, the scientist thinking brain creates consciousness, would have told you the next step beyond the earthworm eye view, because I think the earthworm eye view was the best consciousness my brain could muster while it was soaking in pus. Well, in fact, that's why it was such a deep mystery that instead of nothingness, the next step from that earthworm eye view was one of opening into this white light in this brilliant, ultra-real realm of pure conceptual flow and of love and of emotional power in that gateway realm with the unconditional love 
and the beauty and joy down below me with all of those spiritual beings and the swooping orbs of angelic choirs above. And of course, yet again, not just the melody of that white light that ushered me in, but also the music of the angelic choirs above offered a, a traversal into higher and higher spiritual realms, as I describe in the book, ascending and seeing every bit of this realm collapsing down, even the spiritual realm in what I call deep time, a higher causality, collapsing down and going out into the core, infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with the divine love of an infinite being of compassion and mercy. And of course, when I came back, I was still so absolutely awed and shocked by the power of that beautiful being, that deity at the core of all, in that core realm, that for me, the word God was too puny a word. It was a little human word, and it had a little bit of baggage, and therefore I referred to that infinitely loving being as Alm. That was the sound that I heard in that realm. And of course, it was only years after that that I started hearing that to other people, Alm means something very similar. But I knew nothing of that at that time, and to me, the word Alm had no baggage, and that's why I attached it to that being. But of course, as I started writing all my experience up and trying to explain it, um, I, I realized that to discuss it with other humans, I was referring to what some might call God, others might call Allah, others would call Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh. I don't care what the words are. The words get in the way. They make it look like it's an intellectual discussion, you know, some high school or college debate. It's not. That world is absolutely real. And that is something that is coming to this world in no uncertain terms as this world awakens even now, which I think is happening for a very big reason. Now it turns out the reason that I was so shocked by all this, as I said, the neocortex. Um, modern neuroscience would tell you that uh, the rich details of any kind of conscious awareness and experience depends on at least part of that neocortex, the outer surface of the brain, the human part of the brain, being intact. And that's why severe bacterial meningitis was such a perfect model for human death. And in fact, those who have read the book will realize I put together nine hypotheses. There were actually others that I entertained with colleagues in trying to explain this experience as a brain-based mechanism. I was completely blown away by the power of that ultra-reality, as are so many others who have near-death experiences. And it's something that, of course, we cannot really put into words. And that's part of the trouble of coming back and talking about a realm with butterflies and beautiful flowers and a beautiful girl and souls dancing in angelic choirs. It is people are tempted to think, well, yeah, that's a trick of the dying brain. Well, guess what? I think a better way to look at it is it's much more like Plato's world of forms. It's an ideal world that's much more real than this one. It's the world on which this material universe is based. And it's a realm with which all of our souls are very familiar because we've all been there and we all go back there. And that is a crucial part of this understanding. Now, uh, it turns out that initially when I came back, my doctors would tell me, well, you can forget about it. You know, your brain was way too sick, your neocortex was far too damaged, that was all some trick of the dying brain, it didn't really happen. But I knew something had happened. Uh, as I said, my, all of my knowing of brain-mind consciousness had been deleted. That only returned over about eight weeks afterwards. And in the meantime, my doctors had kind of given me this clue. It had to be a brain-based trick. And so, in fact, uh, that's how I treated it, even though I found it to be astonishing. As I told my older son, Evan IV, who came home the day before Thanksgiving five years ago, and that was uh, two days after I got out of the hospital, he could tell there had been a tremendous change. He had seen me in the hospital the, for four days and nights. He had gotten there that first night right before Phyllis arrived and saw that corpse being ventilated 12 times a minute by the machine. He knew I was already gone. And so he was especially shocked. Of course, he had heard uh, that I was coming back to this world, and he came home from school that day before Thanksgiving, and he was amazed. He looked at me. I was 13 pounds lighter, had an IVN, getting home antibiotics, but he could tell there had been a tremendous transformation. I was much more present than I'd ever been. And he could tell the passion I had to try and record all this and understand it. And of course, I wanted to read everything I could about near-death experiences. And he gave me the best advice I've ever received. He said, don't read anything about near-death experiences, physics or cosmology, until you've written down everything. 
So I spent the next six weeks or so writing 20,000 words of everything I could remember from Deep in Coma. The whole story was there in those first days when I came back. Every bit of it was there. And in fact, the evidence was there that it happened between days one and five of a seven-day coma. And that was a tremendous part of understanding. I think to try and pull this together, I, I do want to point out that uh, the, what I went through after that time was trying to come to a deeper understanding of consciousness. Important to define here, consciousness is not the voice in our head. I would have thought that before my coma, you know, the little voice that we hear in our head. That's actually your linguistic brain. It's tightly tied up with ego and with self. And in fact, there is far deeper wisdom within our consciousness. And the little voice in the head is not even the decision maker, oddly enough. I talk about that briefly in my book, I'm referring to the experiments of Benjamin Leibitt, where you can actually record electrically over the uh, surface of the scalp, record brain activity, and demonstrate that that little voice in the head is informed of the decision, but it's not the decision maker, because the decision is made earlier than that little voice is aware of it. Um, an important implication of all this, for some people, they often ask, well, are animals conscious? Well, actually, animals can be extremely conscious. I would say even more so than humans sometimes, because the little voice in our head actually gets in the way of deeper consciousness. That's why I do so much work now with meditation, centering prayer, the work with sacred acoustics, as I've said, in developing sound uh, files that help people get into deep transcendental conscious states, which I am convinced are freeing us up into non-local consciousness. Uh, the, the true consciousness, a better way to look at it, is the observer. It's the observer that sees that voice. And uh, that is the real mystery. I would say the voice in our head is little more than a fancy parlor trick. As a neurosurgeon, I knew the parts of the brain devoted to that are very small and minimal. Uh, in fact, the observer aspect is the far richer uh, part of this, and that's uh, something that I get much more in tune with uh, in the meditations. Now, it's important to uh, point out that this, it's not like this is a, a simple issue, the mind-body debate, you know, trying to look at what is mental versus what is physical phenomena, the mind and the brain. That discussion's been going on for more than 2,600 years. You'd think we'd be getting close to some kind of an answer. Uh, well, I think we are getting closer to an understanding, but I also realize from my journey that human brain and mind will never understand everything. And in fact, the hard problem of consciousness, which basically says that no neuroscientist on Earth can give you the first sentence to explain how the physical brain might give rise to consciousness, is arguably the most vexing conundrum known to all of human thought, the hard problem. And that is something that I was really not very aware of uh, before my, my coma. So uh, I think it is important to point out we are conscious in spite of our brain. Uh, the brain is there more as a reducing valve or filter. In fact, I, I recently finished Wilder Penfield's wonderful book, uh, The Mystery of the Mind, which was published in 1975. Penfield was probably one of the most renowned neurosurgeons of the 20th century. And he probably still holds the record with having stimulated the uh, brain, electrical stimulation of, awake, of the brain in awake patients more than any other neurosurgeon. He did it tens of thousands of times. And one thing that he was absolutely convinced of, the mind is not in the brain. Never once in all of those stimulations was there a free will type of event. Every single one, no matter what the effect of that electrical stimulation, uh, the patient felt like a puppet on a string. They knew. And, and the point that Penfield took from this is it was very clear, as it's clear to me, the mind is not created by the brain. And the implication is tremendous. The implication is that when, the, the, when our awareness is freed up from the physical brain and body, say at the time of bodily death, it actually comes to a much higher level of awareness, reuniting with the souls of departed loved ones and with the divine, going through that life review. It's, uh, a tremendous shift in my understanding of brain, mind, consciousness, and the very nature of all of existence. And as I said, not only the, the hard problem, but the hard problem of consciousness, but the enigma of quantum mechanics is a very, very deep mystery that demands that pure materialism uh, basically says that pure materialism in science is far too simplistic and cannot possibly explain it. Soul, spirit, consciousness, absolutely real, 
at the core of all that exists. And that is a tremendous shift in my thinking and for a lot of others. But I tell you, a lot of the scientific community, medical schools, nursing schools asking me to come speak, this is an awakening that the scientific community is very much uh, open to. Uh, people often ask, what do your scientific colleagues, the, your critics, think of this? Well, um, I had a lot of help from very open-minded skeptics, open-minded critics in trying to get deeply into this mystery and understand the revelations of my journey. And uh, that's to be distinguished from uh, the few voices out there that are so hooked into scientific materialism that they can't possibly let go of their thinking and they insist that my adventure must have been some hallucination or dream. Well, important to point out that for weeks after my coma, I was my own worst critic. I was the one thinking it had to have an explanation in the brain. I was the one going to my colleagues and to my doctors and others, going through those medical records and trying to explain it as occurring in my brain. And it was really through their insistence that I started realizing it was too real to be real, as I had told Evan the Fourth the day before Thanksgiving, because it really happened. But it really happened in a realm that's far more real than this one at the eternal home of our spiritual souls. And I think very much that my message is one that transcends some of the confusion that can come from that either or thinking. It says you're either spiritual or you're scientific. And also that says that there are fundamental differences between the religions and that one religion might be better than the others. Well, in fact, that kind of thinking is very misleading and confusing. It's, it's a dogmatic, uh, basically dysfunctional human thinking, trying to kind of limit things out and compartmentalize it, and that's where so much of the confusion comes in. So it's very much by ascending above and beyond those false definitions and boundaries that we can get much closer to truth. And in fact, I came to realize that pure materialist science is a dead end. It will succumb to those deep mysteries at the impasse of the hard problem of consciousness and the enigma of quantum mechanics. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the idea of the god of the gaps. That's a general idea in kind of the skeptical and scientific community that God fills in the gaps for what we don't know. Of course, in this era of publish or perish, or as I used to say at Harvard, publish and perish, <laughs> it turns out that um, God of the gaps uh, is an idea where publish and perish, and then finally somebody has a theory of everything, and of course they're clamoring to get to the front of the line to give you the theory of everything. One thing my journey showed me very clearly, human brain and mind will never have a theory of everything. Don't be a fool. Don't go that route and embarrass yourself. And what I would put out there is what do you think God of the gaps looks like if there is truly an infinitely powerful God at the core of all existence? I would tell you that looks a whole lot like the hard problem of consciousness, the deepest mystery known to all of modern human thinking. And that should be a clue to us as to what's really going on here. Now, to know these truths, you don't have to die. That's why I'm a big fan of deep meditation, centering prayer, and once again, uh, remind you the work of sacred acoustics, those who are interested. Uh, in those kind of sound meditations. Uh, I work very closely with them to develop these, and you can go to sacredacoustics.com to learn more about all that and about brain entrainment through sounds. Uh, it turns out that, as I often say, we're conscious in spite of our brain, and the brain actually, I believe, serves as a veil. And I would say, in fact, that that neocortex is a big part of the veil. To me, the very clear proof of that in my experience had to do with that transition in the earth where my view, seeing that beautiful melody, that white spinning light that came towards me and opened up into an ultra-real, rich, vibrant, verdant valley far beyond earthly description. And I was deeply mystified by that transition from what I saw as the best consciousness my brain could muster soaking in pus, this very primitive, unresponsive realm, up into the brilliance of that valley. And I would say that, in fact, that's what led me into the audio manipulations of, of brain entrainment was thinking if I could occupy my neocortex electrically using sound as uh, is portrayed in uh, uh, the work of sacred acoustics that maybe I could duplicate that and that's why deep meditation centering prayer for me 
is a, a very clear avenue to get right back into those realms and to much deeper knowing of those guides of that eternal, infinite, spiritual uh, God at the core of it all. For those out, out there in neuroscience who say, wait a minute, you're saying that some kind of damage to the neocortex can lead to uh, enhanced function? Well, I would point out terminal lucidity. I give an example of that in my book, and this is something often seen. Uh, when a demented elderly patient is in the process of leaving their physical body once and for all, they have moments of lucidity where their thinking is clearer than it's been in years. And they often have that at times when they're seeing the souls of departed loved ones there to see them. That's an example of thinning of the veil of the brain and allowing us to see the true richness of our existence. The other example I'd give out there for the clinical neuroscientist having their doubts are the phenomena of acquired savant syndromes. Uh, and of course, after brain injury and, and autism, things like that, uh, people can have very advanced, superhuman abilities of memory, of calculation. Uh, I had one patient who had been hit in the head with a baseball and he came to me afterwards and uh, realized that he, he asked me if I had a map, I showed it to him and then he looked at it for two seconds and went on to draw the entire map just from memory. And he said, Doc, I couldn't do that before, can you explain that to me? No, I really couldn't, but I'm getting closer to it now. I think to close, I would like to finish with a quote from one of my favorites. And those who've read the book realize I quote Albert Einstein a lot. But this quote is actually from Nikola Tesla. Tesla, a brilliant, brilliant scientist who I think is somewhat underrated by our scientific historians. And Tesla said that when science begins to investigate non-physical phenomena, and I would paraphrase, that would include uh, consciousness, soul, and spirit phenomena. In the first decade, science will uncover more than in all of its previous history. And I believe we're getting into that decade even as we speak. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Eben Alexander. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker is neurosurgeon and author, Dr. Eben Alexander. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us here at Westminster Church for our winter spring season, which begins on Tuesday evening, February 11th, when Sue Monk Kidd, the author of The Secret Life of Bees, will be our guest speaker. Visit our website, westminsterforum.org, in the weeks ahead for information on our upcoming season. And now, Dr. Alexander, if you would return to the pulpit, I'm tempted to call on the choir for a little bit of music, but they're, they're shaking their heads. So if, if you will return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. Okay, thank you. In your book, you repeatedly use the phrases up there and down here. Can you describe for us something of the geography of consciousness? Okay, well, I, that's a very good point. Um, it turns out it's all right here. And in fact, uh, that part of the understanding, as I said, this. Uh, uh, trying to comprehend my journey and how to put it together in proper perspective. A huge part of that understanding is realizing that the material world, as I pointed out, the materialists are in a headlong rush to tell you there's no material to it. In fact, they're also in a headlong rush to tell you that past and future are not at all what they appear to be. Uh, they are really constructs of consciousness, and they're fairly symmetrical at that. Um, I think to, uh, to understand what I've had to wrestle with, I think, uh, the near-death and shared-death experiences. Shared-death are where uh, souls are there when, uh, when others make the transition, when they leave their physical body. And I know there's some in this audience today uh, who have had a shared-death experience where your soul goes right out there. And, of course, that's in a perfectly normal physiological setting. So it kind of blows all those little trivial non-answers that science has about bright light and the tunnel and all out the window when you start hearing about shared death experiences. But all of this reality that we see 
is not what it appears. And that, I think, is the important thing to understand. Heaven is right here. God is within us all. In fact, the divine spark in our consciousness that keeps us from being what in consciousness discussions is called a philosophical zombie. That is something that looks and acts and quacks just like a human but has no inner awareness. Is that divine spark? Is that God within us all? And so the short answer to your question is that geography involves everything being right here. And the mind is a, a hologram that's very, very uh, I would say, very much the same hologram as the universe. You describe in your book that millions of people have had near-death experiences. I wonder if we might try a little test in our audience here. How many of you have had or know of someone who have had a near-death experience? Could we see you raising of hands? And I'm, for the radio audience, I would uh, do a quick calculation of uh, 150 or so from the... Yeah. That's about 10% yeah. of the audience, probably. Right. Can you describe your interaction with the... the you use the phrase a near-death community. Uh, in terms of what you experienced and what others experienced in their near-death uh, experiences? Well, I think the important thing to understand is we're trying to use earthly language to describe something that is uh, very much not of this world. As I said, that gateway realm, even though it had earthly trappings with a beautiful girl and the butterflies and flowers and waterfalls and angelic choirs, was far beyond my ability to actually put into words. And that's why when, when I give a talk like this, to fellow near-death experiencers, the communication far transcends the words themselves. In fact, I would, I would say that a lot of our communication here today probably transcends the words themselves because of the reminding of souls of something they know deep down. And that's why so, I advise all to pursue that through their own meditation and centering prayer because you can read the books and watch the DVDs and go to the presentations till the cows come home if you don't go there yourself. Some of these deeper truths, and of course much of it cannot be brought back into pure linguistic form, um, becomes apparent. So that's did, my recommendation. Did you experience regret at leaving that higher form of consciousness? Well, I think a, a beauty of my journey, one thing that I point out uh, in many of the presentations, uh, there's an atypical feature of my near-death experience in that I was amnesic. I did not remember anything about Evan Alexander's life. In fact, words, language, every bit of that completely wiped out, uh, which in some ways makes mine the exception that proves the rule. And it took me actually more than a year to get deeply into why and how that might have happened. And it has to do with the fact that to, to get the full power of the reality of the journey, I had to be amnesic for my life before, and, and I think those who have read the book will understand where that's coming from. But it had to do with the identity of the beautiful uh, girl on the butterfly wing. And uh, that gave it some very atypical features, but in fact, uh, what I came to realize, especially when I started reading not only the near-death literature, but the afterlife literature going back thousands of years, and of course the writings of religious mystics and prophets going back thousands of years from all faiths, is the similarities far outweigh the differences. And of course, the skeptics can bang their head into the trees about the differences between these uh, tales without realizing that there's a far deeper reality underlying them. And that's the part to know about. The Town Hall Forum audience is uh, deeply musical. And uh, of course, we also began this program with Kathy Romey and the Minnesota Chorale, so they're, they're primed for music. And uh, you, you mentioned music, and there are a number of questions coming in about the nature of that music. Can you describe it? Could you hum a tune, maybe? Or? Anybody bring a kazoo? Well, in fact, um, I'm working on bringing that music back. I can tell you, you cannot bring it back fully to this realm. Uh, and I'm not a musician, which makes it a little more difficult, but I am working with people who are very good at that. Saskia Moore, who works in London on something called Dead Symphony, uh, and also working with Alexandra Tanuth, who is a, a very close friend in New York City, who is, has an interest in ancient musical instruments and tuning, and of course he does a lot of the work also with sacred acoustics. Sacred acoustics, Kevin Cossey and Karen Newell, are actually deeply involved in how sound has been used at ancient sites of worship and of transcendental types of conscious journeys. Um, and so music is a crucial part of it, but I cannot hum those tunes. I'm working on bringing it back, but it has everything to do with the work that I do with sacred acoustics. So you can learn more about that by checking them out. A number of Lutherans in the crowd today asking questions about hell. Uh, <laughs> laughter 
Yes, of course. Tell, tell us about your concept of hell, having gone through what you went well, through. Well, you know, people would often ask me when I talked about that earthworm eye view, they would say, well, gosh, that sounds like hell or purgatory. I would think hell would be at least a little bit interactive. And uh, that earthworm eye view was, was nothing of the sort. I, uh, I came to realize, of course, the best way to look at that earthworm eye view is it was the best consciousness my brain could muster soaking in pus. But it was very clear to me from my journey and from that all-powerful, all-loving deity beyond words, beyond description. That love is something that is impossible to put into words. We can kind of slightly glimpse it. It's one of those beautiful values of a near-death experience, but again, you can all come to know this through deep meditation, centering prayer, exactly the same all-loving God. But coming back, it was clear to me that there was no eternal hell because that God would not create an eternal damnation you know, souls that would be doomed to an eternal damnation. But of course, it also points out that the eternity of our souls has everything to do with our being here to learn lessons. The lessons involve nothing more complex than loving ourselves, which is far more difficult than I realized before. Loving ourselves is actually the core problem with so much of the wrongs of this world that we don't even love ourselves enough. We're reaching outside and trying to deserve and show ourselves worthy of that love that at some base level, as I pointed out in my book with my adoption history being put up for adoption, that I wrestle with that for so much of my life. And that, that that love, loving ourselves, loving our neighbors, loving our enemies, it's all about that love, compassion, forgiveness. And of course, the life review, if we have any residual lessons to learn from this incarnation, uh, that has to do with uh, not loving appropriately and handing out pain or suffering to others, the life review is where we get the final glimpse of that because we have to live through the pain and suffering we've meted out to others, but we have to feel it on their behalf in a realm where it's far sharper and crisper than they ever had to feel it in this incarnation. So there's no need for an eternal hell. Your experience sounds a lot like the results of Alpert and Leary's drug testing years ago at Harvard. Any thoughts on the use of psychedelic drugs to awaken consciousness? Well, people would often approach me, and this is something I mention in the appendix of my book and the different um, neurological hypotheses about how this might have happened in my brain. Many people have come up to me and said, well, obviously, uh, this is uh, what happens when you release DMT, dimethyltryptamine. It's an endogenous uh, transmitter in our brain that actually is a strong hallucinogen. Um, and it's been put out there as one of the major theories to explain near-death experiences. Now, in my case, of course, DMT doesn't cut it because my neocortex, which is where the DMT would work, was greatly inactivated. So DMT could play no role. I went to a conference in Madison, Wisconsin a year and a half ago that was uh, a two-day conference on uh, the bioethics of death. The first day was on near-death experiences. Surprising to me, the second day was on psychedelic drug experiences. Uh, and I think there are uh, some parallels. I think there are lessons that can be learned from those drugs, but my, my strong advice to most people out there, and especially the young getting into this, is meditation is a far cleaner way of getting to these truths. I think the splash that happens with some of the psychedelic drugs is so extreme that it's very hard to come back with the message because it gets so corrupted by the tremendous splash in the neurochemistry induced by those uh, psychedelic drugs. One of our listeners in the audience says, just after I read your book, I was contacted by a good friend who, because of infection, was in an induced coma for 21 days. His experience was quite the opposite of yours, one horrific nightmare after another. Can you shed some light on that? Are all comas the same? Okay, that's a very good question. I think there are uh, a few major points to make about that. One is those who study near-death experiences will realize that about 2 or 3 percent of near-death experiences are what are called hellish NDEs. Now, surprisingly enough, uh, the vast majority in our culture that is kind of hooked into this materialist mindset, the vast majority of near-death experiences in our culture are of souls that rocket right up into those beautiful realms and are very willing to let go of their physical kind of ego and, you know, this, this incarnation. Uh, those hellish NDEs, in my view, are incomplete. If I had gone to the earthworm's eye view and then come back to this world, I would have had a hellish NDE. And uh, that, is, that is my interpretation, is that um, 
that they are, are uh, simply incomplete and that uh, the vast majority is, is I, I would like to assure each and every one of you the message is very uh, sincere and very powerful. You are deeply loved. And it's simply by knowing that the infinite power of light and love in the universe, a God beyond all description, loves each and every one of our souls so dearly as to welcome us into those higher realms without any you know, further problem. So in fact, I think uh, you know, the, a drug-induced coma can be a very different thing, uh, although people can have very profound NDEs even in a drug-induced coma. Was your experience time dependent? If your coma had lasted only one day instead of the seven, would you, do you think you would have experienced something different? That's a very good question too. If you, if you would ask me in, when I came out of coma uh, in those first few days, how long were you there? I would have said months, years, I don't know. I mean, any concept of time gets completely lost. Very important to point out, as I said earlier, that material science is, uh, coming to a point where they'll be telling you that past and future are not what they appear to be. This has to do with getting into the really deep mysteries of quantum mechanics and of relativity and of trying to bring them together and come to a deeper understanding and coming to realize that there is no arrow of time in the world of pure physics. It can flow either way very easily. And I think um, uh, what was clear to me is that time flow in that higher realm, in that spiritual realm of the gateway and the core, is completely independent of time here. We live in this kind of molasses-like river of time and we feel like we just float along without any control. But it's important to understand when people discuss those life reviews and go through those moments of their life of good and bad where they still have residual lessons to learn, that th those are not some vague sepia-tinted memory. They're sharp, crisp, clearer than when they were lived in this material realm. That is an important clue. That time flow in that higher realm, and it also explains so much about near-death experiences. For example, the terminal lucidity case that I present in my book uh, with a very good friend who was the head of a neurosurgery, neuroscience department, who was there with his own father who passed over and was welcomed by the soul of his mother. That would be the grandmother of my friend, who had departed 65 years earlier. I promise you she was not watching the clock waiting for him. That's an important thing to get. Causality and deep time, totally different from this. This is the stage on which the drama is to unfold. It's very cleverly constructed. And it's here for a reason. We're supposed to have faith in that eternity of souls, in that afterlife realm, in that heaven, in that dwelling place of the divine, and not know it as clearly as the moon rising in the sky every night. That's for a reason. This is soul school. Why wasn't this more obvious to you before the coma? The rest of us are well, unlikely ever to have a coma in this sort of NDE. Uh, well, that, that's, that's exactly why in the book uh, I try and take it well beyond my own personal journey and much more what it points out about consciousness, the nature of consciousness, the enigma of quantum mechanics, and the hard problem that basically points out that giant white elephant in the room of conventional neuroscience that would put out, okay, the brain creates consciousness and we can only know what we know through our limited physical senses. Well, in fact, I saw very clearly that those are absolutely false. And to the scientists in the crowd who want to pursue it more deeply, especially about non-local consciousness, how we can know things far away from us in space and time, remote viewing, uh, telepathy, psychokinesis, um, past life memories in children, uh, the, the list goes on and on. And I would steer people to Eternia, E-T-E-R-N-E-A dot org. That is listed at the end of my book, and that's a site that educates the public about frontier science, about how spirituality and science strengthen each other, and the physics of consciousness. It also, at Eternia.org, is a beautiful place for millions to share their own story, to tell your own spiritually transformative experience, not just near-death experiences, but far beyond that. And this is really about an awakening of, uh, of science and really of this whole world that I would say is clear in reviewing the destiny of humanity over the last 6,000 years, that we're at a point that was very predictable. Have you or any of your colleagues changed their practice of letting nature take its course because of your experience? Well, I would say that 
I have come to see healing in a completely new way, a much more enlightened view that sees each and every one of us as physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual and divine beings, that our consciousness is all one, that learning the lessons here has to do with seeing the hardships in life, and that of course includes disease and injury, that these are gifts, they're opportunities for growth, and that is what our soul is doing here, is learning from those hardships. And the old saying, God never gives us more than we can handle, I believe at some level is true. And I promise you that for the depths and darkness of the valley that you may walk through is matched by the brilliant light and love that comes from the lessons that are learned there. You described how some of the uh, scientists, uh, uh, the, the skeptical reaction you've gotten from, and critical reaction from scientists, what do you kind of reaction to get from clergy to your comments? Well, I would say I feel that I'm being very much embraced by clergy. Again, uh, my message is very clear, that infinitely loving God, that God loves Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, skeptics, atheists, bloggers. That God loves all. <laughs> that God loves all life. And that's what we are all here to do. And anything that, that teaches separatism and divisiveness and conflict is wrong. It's twisted. It's dysfunctional human control over other humans. Has nothing to do with the original messages of those prophets. And I would say souls know this, and this is part of the global conscious awakening that is coming to this world now. It's going to be unprecedented change, and I'm very optimistic about where it's going. Thank you, Dr. Evan Alexander. Well, thank you. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.